kindness and faithfulness in your life, if he has preserved you this 20th day of the month of October, if Jesus has kept you, if Jesus has strengthened you, if Jesus has fortified you, give him praise this morning. Come on. Yes. That shout, that shout is like some people have eaten breakfast before coming to church. Did some people just, maybe you just took one, you know, you just use, put your hand into the loaf of bread and just took. Any amount that came out, you just take it. Praise the Lord. But how many of us are enjoying the fast? Yes. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You may please be seated. You may please be seated. This is a special day and I want to give God praise for the lives of our parents in the Lord. Thank you, Big Daddy in absentia. I know you're watching, sir. And Big Mommy in the house. Can we just extend our love and our appreciation to our parents? Thank you, Ma. Thank you, sir, for your love. Thank you for guiding us. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for mentoring us. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for showing us the way. I truly bless the name of the Lord for your life, Ma, and also for Big Daddy's life and how you continue to spur us on on this journey. Your desires in our lives will not be cut short in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to salute every senior pastor in the house, every leader, every person. And I want to also appreciate you for being in church this morning. Appreciate yourself for being in church this morning. And also to the online audience, our virtual community, we thank you from wherever you're streaming this service live. We trust the Holy Spirit that the same power in this place reaches out to you where you are and does you good in Jesus' name. How many of us are ready for the word this morning? Are you ready for God's word? It's, a, it's an instructive word. It's an instructive word. And I trust the Holy Spirit to help me this morning. All right, let us pray. Father, it's in the name of Jesus that we have come. We sit at your feet to learn of you. Thank you because the entrance of your word gives light and understanding to the simple. Thank you because I will not be heard, I will not be seen, but Jesus and Jesus alone be glorified in this place. Thank you because everyone that hears this word now and even into the future shall be transformed by the power inherent in your word in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Thank you because you're speaking through my vocal cords. Thank you because you're thinking through my mind. Thank you because Jesus is glorified in this place to the shame and destruction of the adversary. In Jesus' awesome name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. All right, this morning I'll be speaking to us on what I've titled, Know Your Place. Know Your Place. Tell your neighbor, know your place. Yes, know your place. Second Chronicles 20, our foundation scripture for the fast, from verse 3. I'll start from verse 3 and I'll go to 15. And it says in New Living Translation, Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news and begged the Lord for guidance. Now, we should know the start of this story by now, right? We know the start of this story by now, don't we? All right. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah and Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard at the temple of the Lord. He prayed, O Lord, God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. O our God, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people Israel arrived? And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? Your people settled here and built this temple to honor your name. They said, whenever we are faced with any calamity such as war, plague, or famine, we can come to stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us and rescue us. And now see what the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir are doing. You would not let our ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Egypt. 
So they went around them and did not destroy them. Now see how they reward us, for they have come to throw us out of your land, which you gave us as an inheritance. Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. As all the, arm, as all the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, wives, and children, the Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there. His name was Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jael, son of Mataniah, a Levite who was a descendant of Asaph. Verse 15, he said, Listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Message translation of that same verse 15 says, All of you out of town, attention everyone, all of you from out of town, all you from Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, God's word, don't be afraid. Don't pay any mind to this vandal horde. This is God's war, not yours. This is God's war, not yours. I start by saying that man is a relational being. Man is a relational being. And humans are social species. And we always seek to connect with each other to feel a sense of interdependence. Praise the Lord. Consequently, through the different phases of life that we are privileged to experience, every single one of us, at any given time T, like the scientists will say, at any given time T, you are involved with at least one person, relationally or interpersonally. You are involved with at least one person, relationally. And you know what? It's a necessary prerequisite for survival on earth. You hear the words that no man is an island, and that's very true. Because you cannot exist in isolation. You cannot survive in isolation. God has not made this world in such a way that man can live by himself. Even God is triune in nature. Self-existing, yet three different persons. Praise the Lord. Now, all the relationships that we have are interpersonal as human beings. And as much as there are different categories or types of these relationships that we engage in, the uniqueness of each one boils down to the degree of closeness between the parties. Boils down to the degree of closeness. Follow me. Just follow me. Now, science is daily. I'm talking about now interpersonal relationships. Science is daily defines interpersonal relationships as social associations, social connections, or affiliations between two or more people. They vary in different levels of intimacy and sharing, implying the discovery or establishment of common ground and may be centered around something or some things that are shared in common. Now, that's a very, very important definition. Because not only does it tell us or define what interpersonal relationships are, it gives us insight. It gives us insight into reasons for which some relationship bonds are stronger than others. Some relationship bonds are more rewarding than others. When the parties have established common ground, when the parties have shared values, shared interests, and I'll make it very simple for you. Because this, is, this affects everybody seated here right now. Everybody. Now, think about your life in one, in one minute. Think about your life. And think about the different interpersonal relationships that you have with different people. Across board. It can be within church. It can be outside of church. As you're thinking, there are certain people that you are closer to. You are closer to Mr. A than Mrs. B. You're closer to Mrs. B than Mrs. Z. Why? Why? Because there is some form of common ground between 
that person with whom you are closer to. There is some form of, there are some shared values, there are some values, interests that you share together. And those interests bring you closer to each other. So that from the time you connect and you start talking, you realize that he likes what you like. Oh, you have the same interests that I have. Oh, and it endears you to that person. Yes or yes? All right. It endears you to that person. And that relationship blossoms. It continues to grow. When we look at church, as we're seated here, this also applies. When you look at the different ministry arms that we have, you see that ministry arms are centered around interests. When you look at people who are interested in music, where do you find them? You find them in Ivy Nation. They have a flair for music. When you look at people who want to organize things and get people in order and all that, where do you find them? Good. When you see people who love to smile and welcome people, first time, they just have this natural thing, gifting or smiling. Where do you find them? When you think about people who, are, who just love technology and media and want to deploy their gifts in that area, where do you find them? You find them in media. So ministry arms are also centered around interests. Everybody in that ministry arm, you will not find somebody in Evie Nation who does not at least know some notes or have the flair for singing. They might come in very raw and at the point of entry, Dr. Nikkei, what? No, 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 who told you you can sing? No, 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 no. But the sheer interest that that person has helps them to overcome whatever deficiencies they have in their natural giftings because there's a shared interest and so they connect. Right? They connect. All right. Now, we look at it in terms of G12 also. And that's why the G12 is different from the heart solution. Because with G12, you can have G12 cells that are interest-based. You can have a G12 for lawyers. You can have a G12 for logistic professionals. You can have a G12 for dramatists. It's fluid like that. So if you are boxing yourself into you know, an area where you say, oh, I don't have people, no. A new entrant will, be, will feel more comfortable coming to a G12 that is for lawyers if he's a lawyer because he knows that he has like-minded people in that G12 cell. Yes or yes? He's comfortable because he gets to learn the word, he gets to share the word, and he also gets to network with other lawyers like himself. Now, also within our fellowship groups, I know the fellowship groups are huge. We have the great young men, we have the young women, we have the Christian men, Christian women, young adult fellowship, um, uh, Catalyst Hub, all of that. But you know that to deepen connection in our fellowship groups, we can also create smaller interest groups that speak to the different needs of the people in the larger body. Yes or yes? So if the young women Christian fellowship, for example, have a smaller group for newlyweds, right? Newlywed ladies, where they encourage them, where they just gather together, oh, what's your experience like? And they just share. And you have mentors in that, they belong, they find expression in those smaller groups and feed into the larger one. I'm just giving us ideas, right? Giving us all ideas. Now, that in itself fulfills a critical part of our mission statement where it says that we are big enough to contain you and we're small enough to reach you. Everybody is reached, everybody is touched, everybody is impacted. Now, according to different studies, I'm going to run very quickly, I don't have all the time, there are at least five major types of interpersonal relationships. Number one, or before I say that, what defines the relationships is the context of the relationship connection, which largely informs the expectations that the respective individuals have. And by expectations, you talk about their attitudes, their dispositions, their behavior, their mannerisms. Five major categories of interpersonal relationships. Number one, the family. The family. The family is the first type of interpersonal relationship that anybody on earth would create. 
the first time. Whether it's just you and a single mother or single father or you and father mother with siblings or you and only father mother or you and uncle or grandma, the family is the first interpersonal relationship that anyone creates. Now, with families, all of us were here, there are varying degrees of relationships that you have with your parents or your siblings. There are siblings that you have that you're closer to. There are others that you have that you're not, you're not as close to. You're still siblings, but you're not close. But there's that one that you're close to and you relate well with, right? So the depth and the strength of the type of the interpersonal relationships varies depending on the individuals with whom we connect and form a bond over time. The next is friends. Sometimes friendships tend to provide us with a greater sense of connection and support than even family. Yes or yes? Proverbs 18 verse 17, verse 24, I beg your pardon. He that, is friend, he that desires friends must be friendly. A man that has friends must show himself friendly and there is a friend that still gets closer than a brother. So sometimes friendship relationships can be and where you have these types of relationships that are, that are strong and reliable, it has some ingredients which include trust, transparency, laughter, commitment, unconditional support, common values and interests, equal give and take. Equal give and take. Next, you have romantic partners. Now, in the context of romantic partners, we are speaking specifically to people who have solemnized their matrimony or people who have the consent of the church to walk that path. People who are married or people who have the consent and approval of the church to walk that path. Because as the church, we go and we live by the scriptures. We live by the tenets of the faith. So we do not encourage that you would have a romantic partner with somebody who is not your spouse. But in romantic relationships, you have the most intimate, intimate bonds, both emotionally and physically. There is vulnerability there. Vulnerability. Vulnerability. Praise the Lord. So God, you see that God's intention for marriage is that both parties, man and woman, cleave to one another. They become one in the process. And this lasts for all of their earthly lives. Praise the Lord. And this type of relationship, this type of interpersonal relationship is extremely crucial for one survival. Genesis 2 verse 18, God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. A necessary help. A help he does not even know that he needs. A help that he does not even know that he needs. God says he will make for him. Amplified classic of verse, of, um, verse 24 and 25. It says, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall become united and cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not embarrassed or ashamed in each other's presence. TPT says that he is unselfishly attached to his wife. Unselfishly attached. They become one flesh as a new family. Speaking about process. The man and his wife felt no shame, unaware that they were both naked. Unfortunately, today you have some marriages where one person is naked and the other person is clothed. One person is the vulnerable one. The other person builds a wall as thick as the wall of Jericho. Praise the Lord. Such a relationship cannot thrive. Both must be naked and unashamed. It's necessary. The next type of relationship, you have work colleagues. And now this one, you know, when you have great interpersonal relationships at work, it benefits both the people and the organization. Because when you can trust the people with whom you work, your productivity increases, your output is better, the organization thrives. So it's important. 
It's also good for mental health. And finally, you have platonic relationships. Platonic relationships in the sense where you just have two people who have a close bond between them. Unrelated. They're unrelated in any way. But they just have this close bond that is born out of a shared fondness, care, and mutual respect. Praise the Lord. Now, all these relationship types I've just listed out, all of them would go through five stages or can go through five stages. There are five stages for each of these ones. They can either graduate or they can diminish and it will be down to the people that are involved in those relationships. Because every relationship starts from the place of acquaintance, where somebody introduces you first to another person and you just get to know each other. And if you have shared values, if there is common ground, there is something to work on and build on. From acquaintance, you have continuation. You have building up, brother, where you're building up. So where there's an established common ground, you continue to build that relationship. And it progresses into a continuation. At this stage, the people involved are enjoying that relationship. Now the fourth stage, the fourth stage is degradation. The fourth stage is degradation. Depending on what ensues in that relationship during continuation and how it is handled, that once thriving relationship can begin to deteriorate, can begin to decline. And if nothing is done, if remedial action is not taken, or if a remedial action is taken but is not sufficient, that decline can lead to termination. So those are the five stages of relationships, interpersonal relationships. Now you probably are wondering, are we in a relationship school? Are we in a relationship class? You'll understand me. Now, with everything I've said, with everything I've said, would you understand, you think, you know that anthropologists, so people who study human behavior, they have tried, scientists, they've tried to, to understand the limits of our human connections. So an anthropologist, a British man by name Robin Dunbar, Robin Dunbar, in the 90s carried out some research and he put a limit on the number of social connections, the maximum number of social connections that any human being can sustain effectively. And he put that number at 150 to say that for you as a human being, by the methods he applied, you can only sustain 150 social connections. You can sustain. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody, you say something like, Somebody is trying to get to know you and you're like, I, 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 don't have, I don't have strength for, I don't have, I don't have the bandwidth for another. Mm, don't disturb me, don't disturb me. I, 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 has it ever happened to you before? Sometimes the brain gets to that point where it can't handle another social connection. Now, so many arguments have ensued following that research where some people are saying, how dare you try to limit or determine the limit of my social connections, especially given social media now where somebody can have seven million followers, another person can have a billion followers. How do you determine that? Some people say, well, are you sure the methodology he used was right? He used it for non-human primates. So he used it for apes. Well, how apes think and how humans think are very different. And some use their own methodology and actually increased it to around 290 social connections that you can sustain as a human being. Meaning that you would know, recognize, and have some level of communication with at least 290 people you can sustain those relationships. What's the end goal of all of this? In all of these interpersonal relationship types and varying stages of closeness, it is expedient to understand that for each one, irrespective of the stage of the relationship, the participants must understand and be conversant with the basis or the context for their respective relationships and know their place in that context, especially as it pertains to the related party and the relationship. Context here, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, is the interrelated conditions in which something exists or occurs. 
Simply put, the terms and conditions, the terms and conditions that define that interpersonal relationship that you have, or that two people have, or that three people have amongst themselves, there are terms and conditions for every relationship. And you must know, that's what you would call boundaries sometimes. That's why when somebody exceeds the point, you say, no, 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 this guy is crossing his boundary. If somebody makes a demand of you, maybe you just met him yesterday, and then in that same instance where you just met that person, they start placing a demand on you. How do you feel? You say, no, we're not, we're not that close. You can't, no, I cannot fulfill it. Even when you have the capacity to do it, because there is no depth of connection, you reject it. Imagine also somebody who is not your spouse makes a demand of you that only your spouse can make. What does that mean? Sexual harassment, some people will call it. That is plain disrespectful. Plain disrespectful. Why have you determined this so? Because you don't have the depth of connection with that person. They're not your spouse. So they cannot place that demand on you. They can't place that demand on you. All right? And you know what? There are people in your lives that it doesn't matter how things are with you. Once they place a demand, you will go through hell and high water for that person. You will go through hell and high water to meet that need. Even if it means you not having money in your pocket, you will do it. Why? Because the depth of the connection, the depth of the relationship, it's a bond so strong that you cannot stop it. Nothing can inhibit it. You have to. You are obligated to do it. Obligated to do it. So with this understanding, when you read that same scripture again that we just read, 2 Chronicles 20, from verse 1 all the way to verse 17, you will see a different perspective of what Jehoshaphat went through. You might not have seen this before, but I'm going to show you something. You will better appreciate the victory that God gave him. So, in that scripture that we read, Jehoshaphat did something. Do you know that Jehoshaphat never featured in that incident, that story? He did not feature. Jehoshaphat never featured in that story. God, we know, like I said before, is relational. God is relational. And from the moment he created man, he wanted to relate with man. He is the first mover. He is the initiator. Go back to the scriptures. Look at from verse 5 or thereabouts. From verse 5, 6. Now watch. Watch this. He prayed. Keep your eyes. Watch this. Oh, Lord God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are the ruler. You are ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. Do you see Joseph right there? Do you see him there? Okay. Now, verse 7. Oh, our God, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people Israel arrived and did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham verse 8 your people he didn't say we he said your people settled here and built this temple to honor your name verse 9 they said whenever we are faced with any calamity such as war plague or famine we can come to stand where? In your presence. Before this temple, where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us. And you will help, will hear us and rescue us. Verse And now, see what the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir are doing. You would not let our ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Egypt. So they went around them and did not destroy them. Eleven. Now, see how they reward us. For they have come to throw us out of whose land? Whose land? Is it Israel's land? Whose land? 
God's land, which you gave us as an inheritance. Verse 12. Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. God, we, your people are in the midst of an attack on your land. Eh? On your land that you gave us. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for... He did not feature in that at all. It was all God, 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 throughout. 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 Why is he saying this? Because once upon a time, after the fall of man, God in his bid to continue his relationship with man, because he needed to redeem man from the fall, God found himself a man called Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And God zeroed in on him, and God enacted a relationship with him, initiated a relationship with him, set the context of that relationship, set the terms and conditions of that relationship with Abraham. And Abraham obeyed, and the relationship started. Fast forward to verse chapter 15 of Genesis. Abraham comes to a point, he comes to a crossroad in his life, and he says, God, how is it that you have promised me something, and I'm old, and I have not an heir? Is it my servant, Eliezer, that would inherit me? And God comes on the scene and says, once again, my brother, my son, my friend, listen, I made you a promise. I am faithful. I will do that which I have said I will do. How, Lord, will I know that you will do it? And God says to him, listen, go out, look into the skies, count. What do you see? And God, as he's there, God now puts him to sleep. And God does something that changes the course of humanity forever. God cuts a covenant with himself concerning a man. And that sets a template. God cuts a covenant with himself concerning Abraham and the descendants of Abraham. And now, all everything happens. Israel going to Egypt, come out of Egypt, come into the promised land, and it comes down to Jehoshaphat's time. Right? And now, there is an enemy. Or rather, there are three enemies, enemy nations coming against him. See what now happens. Don't forget, the context of the relationship is still there. The terms and conditions are still there. God is obligated to take care of them. God is obligated to take care of them because he swore an oath by himself, by two immutable things in which it's impossible for God to lie. Abraham, your descendants, they're my responsibility. And Jehoshaphat finds himself in a situation. But you know what? Jehoshaphat does something that he has seen before. Jehoshaphat does something. What you saw in 2 Chronicles is a repeat of something that happened before. Join me. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 14 from verse 9 to 13 in message translation. Asa, Jehoshaphat's father. Jehoshaphat's father. I'll read from verse, okay, let me take from verse 8, message. Asa had an army of 300,000 Judeans equipped with shields and spears and another 80,000 Benjamites who were shield bearers and archers. They were all courageous warriors. Zerah, the Ethiopian, went to war against Asa with an army of a million plus, 300 chariots, and got as far as Maresha. Asa met him there and prepared to fight from the valley of Zephatha near Maresha. Then Asa prayed to God, Asa prayed to God, O oh God, you aren't impressed by numbers or intimidated by show of force once you decide to help. Help us, O oh God. We have come out to meet this huge army because we trust in you and who you are. Don't let these, don't let mere mortals stand against you. It's not against us, against you. And so, that says something to me. Asa, for 41 years that he was king, 35 years were good. And it is in these 35 years that he laid this solid foundation for his son. So I'm asking you, father, mother, auntie, uncle, who has a younger person, a child, 
who is looking up to you? Are you modeling the right behavior for that child? Especially as it concerns spiritual things and developing a relationship with God. Especially in the fast. Are you one of those that once service is over, you go and buy chin chin, buy puff puff and drink. And your son is looking at you and saying, Mommy, I thought we were fasting. You say, my friend, go and sit down. You are still a child. Do you know what it takes to be an adult like me? I need food. I need sugar. And your child is saying, Mommy, oh, I thought we were fasting. And you say, God will understand. And that child is watching you. Or are you a parent who on Sunday morning, you can decide this Sunday I'm not going to church. And the child is saying, Mommy, I want to go to church. My, uh, I'm too tired. I'm too tired. Don't worry. Go and sit down. Uh, take, go and watch online. Then tomorrow you come out and say, eh, Pastor, pray, oh, my son is not coming to church again. You're laying the foundation right now. You're laying the foundation right now. Asa lay the solid foundation. Model the right behavior for his son. So yes, he fell at the end of it, doing the opposite of what he, should, he had always done. This time around, he did not trust God for help, but he had always trusted God for help. Always trusted God for help. But Jehoshaphat learned that. And when he came across a similar situation, he knew what to do. He knew what to do. He ran to God. Why? Because he had seen his father do it. And God gave them victory. God gave them victory. God gave them victory. So what does that say? Jehoshaphat, he knew the context of the relationship. Jehoshaphat knew, and that's why in everything that he said, he kept referring, God, you own this place. God, you brought us here. God, you gave us this land as an inheritance. God, you, will you watch? Because he understood, he knew his place, and in that place, in the relationship, he is a sleeping partner. He is a sleeping partner. If Abraham, his father, was a sleeping partner and did nothing to earn righteousness with God, how can he, Jehoshaphat, do something? God, you are. God, you, you are. This is your, why do you think the answer came like it came? Why do you think in the next verse, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel and he started prophesying? Fear not. He says, this is God's war, not yours. Why? Because it had always been about God from the beginning. It had always been about God from the beginning. That is the context of the relationship. So if Jehoshaphat, who was under an old covenant, understood and knew his place and leveraged it for victory, how much more you that are in Christ Jesus, who has been purchased with the blood, the precious blood of the Lamb of God, how much more you Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6. Hebrews 8 and verse 6. Come on, help me. How much more are you? See, Joseph had leveraged. He knew his place in the relationship. He knew that he was just a sleeping partner. He knew that he did not have to do any work. All he needed to do was to trust and rely on the one. He says, but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant that is established on better promises. If Jehoshaphat knew his place and was able to leverage on that covenant that God enacted with his forefather, Abraham, and he got victory, why are you owning a problem that you, have, you don't have the capacity to deal with? Why? Why are you... Oh, my sickness. They say it's my cancer. They say it's my, my debt, my this, my that. You are owning something that you are not equipped to handle. Why any wonder why you don't have answers yet? Because you have not turned it over to him. You need to know your place, child of God. That in this matter, you are a sleeping partner. The lamb was slain on your behalf. You have come into blessing. You have come into a relationship with him wherein he is obligated to take care of you. God is obligated to take care of you. Yeah. 
He's obligated. He's obligated. First Corinthians 6, verse 19 to 20, part of translation. He says, have you forgotten that your body is now the sacred temple of the spirit of holiness who lives in you? You don't belong to yourself any longer. If you didn't hear me, hear it again. You don't belong to yourself any longer. For the gift of God, the Holy Spirit, lives inside your sanctuary. You were God's expensive purchase, paid for with the tears of blood. So by all means then, use your body to bring glory to God. Know your place, child of God. You are no longer your own. You are no longer your own. Paul said, I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, Galatians 2.20. Yet not I. But Christ is in me. And now I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me enough to give himself entirely for me. The life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. You were bought with a price. The precious blood of Jesus. You don't belong to yourself. You have ceased from being in control of your life. God owns you now. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 to 14. New Living Translation, it says, Now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own. He identified you as his own. He put a marker on you by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. Verse 14, the Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us. He has purchased you to be his own people. He did this so that we will praise and glorify him. He did this so that you will praise and glorify him. In this relationship, you don't have anything to contribute. You don't have anything to contribute. That's why you must know your place. You must know your place. You must understand the relationship that's at play here. You must understand the agreement that's at play here. Because if you don't, what would happen is that you continue to exert yourself and exert yourself and you'll be frustrated. That is the unfortunate reality of many believers. The thing is about doing when Jesus has already done. And their part is now to what? Receive what he has done. The benefits of his death, burial and resurrection is yours now to take. It's yours now to take. It's yours now to take. It's, not, it's yours now to take. So stand still is the disposition of the true believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ because you're not your own anymore. Stand still. Stand still. To stand still is to rest. To stand still is to rest. It is understanding that God has not called you to the kitchen. He has called you to the dining table, like my father would say. That's stand still. Stand still is to rest. To stand still is to rest. You have performed enough. Rest. You have held on, you have possessed and owned that challenge enough. Turn it loose. That's what God is asking me to tell somebody today. You have the rest of the month. Turn it loose. You have called it your own for too long. You have identified yourself with that problem for too long. Turn it loose. You don't own yourself. So if anything is attacking you, it's not attacking you. It's attacking the one that owns you. If anything is coming against you, see the template of Jehoshaphat. He says they want to drive us out of the land that you gave us. God, this sickness is trying to ravage the perfect health that you have given me. Change of approach. Change of vocabulary, and you get the answer. It's a change of mindset. God, this situation wants to bring shame to your name because you own me, oh. God, will you watch and see shame come to you? Will you watch? That's what Jehoshaphat did. And the word of the Lord came and said, Don't be afraid. Stand still. 
This war is not yours, it's mine. You have taken center stage enough. You have taken center stage enough. Know your place. Know your place, child of God. Know your place, child of God. Stand still! Like one celebrity said, means to relax and be taken care of. Do you hear what I said? Stand still means relax and be taken care of by God, by your Father. Tell yourself, I will relax and be taken care of. Yeah. Because he's your shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He takes responsibility for me. He takes responsibility for me. He is obligated to me. He's obligated to me. He's obligated to you. Now it makes sense to you how the word of God came. It makes sense to you, right? God was obligated to respond because he was the one that was put on, on stand. Not Jehoshaphat, not, Je not Judah, not Jerusalem. God was on stand. He was obligated to respond. Know your place in this relationship. Know your place. Know your place. Like Big Daddy has consistently taught us, humility is saying, Lord, I cannot, but you can. The late Archbishop Benson Idahosa of blessed memory, in one of his messages said this. He said, one of the greatest prayers you can ever pray is, Lord, help me. That's a disposition of humility. But pride is trying to do what you don't even have capacity to do. And James chapter 4 verse 6 says what? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he said, God resisted the proud, but he gives grace to the home. Know your place. That thing that has ravaged your body, that thing that has caused you sleepless nights, that thing that has almost brought tears, or rather has brought tears and caused you to wet your, your pillow every night, that thing, Turn it over to him. You are not your own. Tell yourself, I am no longer my own. Paul said in Galatians chapter 6 from verse 16 to 17, he said, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the mark of Christ. I bear in my body the mark of Christ. The mark of Christ. Let me, let me find it in, 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 in Amplified Classic. From verse 16, he said, Peace and mercy be upon all who walk by this rule, who discipline themselves and regulate their lives by this principle. Even upon the true Israel of God, you are the true Israel of God. From now on, let no person trouble me by making it necessary for me to vindicate my apostolic authority and the divine truth of my gospel. For I bear on my body the brand marks of the Lord Jesus, the wounds, scars, and other outward evidence of persecutions. These testify to his ownership of me. God owns you. And he's responsible for you. Know your place. Stand still. Turn it over to him. Just pray on your seat in the next one minute. Pray on your seat in the next one minute. What have you been holding on to? What is that thing you have owned and owned and owned and refused to let go of? You have owned it so much so that it identifies you. But you don't own yourself no more. God owns you. He has purchased you with his precious blood. He's responsible for you. Know your place in this relationship. Know your place in this relationship. Know your place in this relationship. God owns you. He's responsible for you. He's obligated to you. He is committed to you.
He owns you. He owns you. He owns you. Oh our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this great army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you. You have owned it enough. Turn it over. Turn it over. Turn it over. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We know our place in this relationship. We know that we are sleeping partners. You are the one who has done. And our part is just to believe. Like Abraham, the father of faith, Lord, we believe you. We believe you. We trust you. We turn it over to you, Lord. And we thank you for taking it over. We thank you for taking it over. Everything, every sickness, every disease, every incident, situation that has brought shame, reproach, embarrassment against your people. They are your people. We are the sheep of your pasture. We are the sheep of your pasture. We are the sheep of your pasture. You are our shepherd, the good shepherd. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I wish above all things that thou prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. That is your father's desire. He owns you. Whatever it is that has caused you pain, he has taken it over. 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 Now you know your place. Now you know your place in this relationship. You're not the one that does. He has done. He has done. He has done. He has done. All you do is believe him. All you do is trust him. All you do is thank him. Because you know him. Guess what? The depth of the relationship, the depth of the relationship here is something that can never be broken. Why? Because it's ratified in the blood of Jesus. You are closer to, you are, you are the closest you can ever be to God. You are the closest you can ever be to God. The Bible says you are united to him. You can't be any more closer than that. You have become one with him. That's the depth of the bond. The strength of the bond. And that's why he will go all out for you. That's why Romans 8 and verse 32 says, If he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? Why? The depth of the bond. It's unbreakable. Know your place in this relationship. Know your place. Know your place. Know your place. That's why Paul asked the question, can anything separate us from the love of God? Can anything separate us? Can anything separate us? Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? It is written for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Hey! Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquered him that loved us for I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come hey can't have us shut up no height no death nor any other creature shall be able not even that problem not even that situation that you walked in with this morning not even it irrespective of how big it is it cannot separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The depth of the bond. The depth of the interpersonal relationship that you have with God. God will do anything for you. The same way you will go all out for that your friend. That your friend. That your friend. Human friend, oh, human friend. 
the almighty the all sufficient god the incredible god the master strategist will go all out for you he will go all out for you that signifies the death of the bond he cannot but do it he cannot but do it god cannot but go all out for you he cannot but go out for you. why because when he sees you he sees his son he will do everything for his son he will do everything for his son when he sees you he sees his son because you are in christ, like christ. so rejoice 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 your testimony is here rejoice you have your testimony in your hands rejoice the tangibility of what you depend from god you already have it rejoice rejoice he will go all out for you yeah. you belong to him you belong to him know your place just know your place that this relationship that you are in with god you are a sleeping partner my father will say go to bed rest rest you are a sleeping partner he didn't call you to the kitchen to come and start turning or washing plates or pots no go and sit down the chargers are set the cutlery is set the dishes are set the wares are set the food is on the table eat Father, we honor you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank him for it. Thank him for it. Oh, Lord, we thank you. At this juncture, under this awesome presence of the Holy Spirit, if you're in this building or you're watching virtually and you have not come in contact with this Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, I want to give you an opportunity. You see, you can only leverage on what you are involved with. And it starts from a relationship. It starts from a relationship. So if you don't know Jesus in this place, under the sound of my voice, and also online, please, it will be my greatest pleasure to lead you to him. To get you acquainted with him. So that he can start with you on this beautiful journey of salvation. Wherever you are, please signify by raising your hands. Yes. Yes. Signify by raising your hands. Anybody? 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 Anybody in church here? Anybody online? Not your neighbor and say, Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Nobody? All right. Just say with me, thank you, Father, because I'm saved, sanctified by the blood of Jesus and filled with the Holy Ghost. Thank you because I'm heaven ready. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. A sign for the communion. A sign for the communion. Jesus said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. His lacerated body, his shed blood. Father, we thank you for every communion element speak your blessing over it that in this instant it becomes your body and your blood as we partake of it we partake of your life in the precious name of Jesus Christ thank you Heavenly Father for in Jesus awesome name we have prayed and Jesus took the body the bread he broke it and said this is my body broken for you take eat this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You eat this with a knowing that because his body was lacerated, because his body was broken down for your sake, your healing is guaranteed. In the same way, if there is power supplied in this place or as there is power supplied in this place, if I turn off or I turn on a switch, if the light bulb were off, if I turn on the switch, by my turning on the switch, the power flows and the light comes on. It's a consequence, a natural consequence that must happen as far as all the conditions are there. In the same way, his broken body is the consequence for your healing, your divine healing. It's a consequence. It happens naturally. So, eat this with the understanding that you are whole. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. And he took the cup, the wine. And when he had supped, he said, this cup, is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you do so, as you drink it in remembrance of me. Drink and give him praise. Thank you, Lord. Just thank you.
it's only proper that we honor him with our seed it's only proper that we appreciate him for what he has already done it's only proper that we say thank you to him with the resources that he has given to us because we trust him because we know he cannot fail the strength of Israel cannot lie he is not a man that he should lie neither is it the son of man that he should repent has he said it will he not do it has he spoken it will he not bring it to pass so your seed your offering your tithe your giving your generous giving this morning is a demonstration of your trust a demonstration of your faith in this God and if you've put together your offering please be upon your feet the details are on the screen for those of us who do transfers and if you're also giving towards the children building project the details are all there lifted up before him are we on our feet are we giving offerings a lot of us are seated down honor God honor him honor him honor him thank you heavenly father for the seeds in our hands thank you because you are the giver you give bread to the eater you give seed to the sower thank you because this seed we bring forth to you in appreciation of all that you have done for us thank you because you've accepted us in the beloved one jesus christ and you have accepted our offerings that these seeds go forth and do your bidding and propagate your kingdom even through this mission in jesus awesome name we have prayed amen celebrate your giving We give you glory, Lord, as we honor you. We give you glory, Lord, as we worship you. You are wonderful. You are worthy, oh God. You are wonderful. You are worthy, oh Lord. We give you glory. We give you we give you praise as we want to you for you are Jesus you are wonderful you are wonderful one more time you are
Pleasure.